Good evening. Welcome to the Henry George School for uh, another exciting night with uh, Dr. Marty Roland, who will be talking today on Henry George's bid for mayor of New York in 1886. Now, most of you here are probably familiar with George as a, the economist, the debater, and the social reformer. However, I believe not enough is known about his political life, which I think was just as interesting. So our speaker tonight, Dr. Marty Rowland, he is a Henry George scholar and a trustee at the SGSS. He's a licensed professional environmental engineer, natural resource economist in the tradition of George, Ostrom, Bromley, and Kate Rawoff. Marty has taught many courses at the school, including the fundamental economics class based on George's progress and poverty. He works with the city's park de department. So Marty, without any delay, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Ibrahima. And I'd like to thank everybody for uh, for calling in for the, the Zoom meeting. I'm excited that I've got uh, people that haven't uh, participated before, uh, people from work, people from my family, so that's great. Um, so before I, wanted, uh, before I get started, I did want to say that uh, uh, there was two main references I used for tonight's uh, talk. Uh, the primary one was a book written in 2015, uh, Columbia University Press, Edward T. O'Donnell, book called Henry George and the Crisis of Inequality. Uh, very good uh, book. The other one was a, a an account of the the election written a few days after it occurred back in 1886. And uh, with those, I, I was able to put together this presentation. So let me, let me go. Um, uh, I'm with the, um, you know, Marty Rowland. I'm with the Henry George School of Social Science. The reason I put the address of 149 East 38th Street, it'll become apparent uh, as I speak but uh, tonight's talk, we're going to be uh, going into the election of 1886, when working men shook the world. Uh, before we get started, I just wanted to make a note that um, there are limitations of the Henry George School. We are a, a 501c3 nonprofit educational uh -oh. organization, and um, in particular, these are the the limitations about uh, no participation intervening campaigning on behalf or op opposition to any candidate for elected office. We'll be talking about uh, politics and political parties, mostly in the past tense. Uh, now, educational institutions can advocate for those causes that further their mission as long as there's no bias. And uh, then I make a little joke at the end, the only way that might be a problem if we went back in time and we uh, landed somewhere between October 5th and November 2nd, we'd be violating those IRS rules, but we're not gonna be doing that. So we're in good shape. So let me uh, get started with the presentation. We'll, the, the rules are that I'll be speaking uh, for approximately an hour uh, maybe less, but we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A because there's a lot of material here and there's a lot of people with expertise that may want to weigh in or ask me some questions. So let's get started. Uh, this is the, the organization for tonight. There's five main sections. I'm going to be going into an introduction uh, of the presentation. Then I'm going to be talking about this category called Molding of George for the Global Stage. Um, that's, um, you know, just what, what was the formative elements of Henry George that brought him to the, the global stage here in uh, New York City. And then the, the Golden Promise, and that was uh, concerning the, the election itself. And then the creation more significant than the author. This is my critique of what happened after the election and uh, the failure of what could have been. And then I'm gonna go into a short conclusion 
uh, a realignment for the redo, which uh, I'll leave that for your imagination, but uh, it'll be bringing it up to uh, the current day. So to begin, let's uh, talk about what uh, our first president of the United States had to say about political parties. Um, back in 1796, pretty much like Eisenhower warned, uh, how Eisenhower warned about the military industrial complex, Washington warned us about political parties. He said the common and continual mischiefs of the spirit of party are sufficient to make it the interest and duty of a wise people to discourage and restrain it. Well, well, we got political parties, but it's good to listen to what the attitude was way back when. So here we go with um, the Tammany Democratic machine. Uh, people who are not from New York City may not be familiar with, with that organization uh, that was around for a very long time. But uh, in my introduction, there's a, a guy who was active. His name was Fatty Walsh, of all things. Uh, he quipped uh, about George's chances for being elected mayor in, in 1886. He said, what are them labor fellows thinking about? Do they think they can elect anybody? They haven't no inspectors or poll clerks. Well, okay, uh, pretty much laying out what it takes to have a successful uh, political campaign. And I'll be getting into the, um, the obstacles for running for political office that Henry George faced. So here's a, another famous Tammany Democrat uh, named Boss Tweed who said, um, stop them damn pictures. I don't care what the papers write about me. My constituents can't read, but damn it, they can see the pictures. So you can see the disdain that he had for the people that uh, were on, in his political machine and the people that he uh, uh, made appearance of um, serving them. So my, my little joke is, Take the Demo Tammany Democrats, please take them. Uh, a reference to. Uh, or we'll never see what she writes. <laughs> <laughs> to Henny Youngman there. So uh, here we go with uh, uh, future Mayor Hewitt. This is a guy that Henry ran against. He and his son, uh, and the son of Peter Cooper, Edward. He took down the Tammany uh, machine temporarily after a $20 million scandal in 1871. Both of these guys are very uh, formative people in New York City. Peter Cooper, of course, being uh, the guy that uh, started the uh, Cooper Union, also a manufacturer with, uh, with Hewitt. So uh, when it came time for um, the, the election, uh, Hewitt, uh, Hewitt necessarily merged his county democracy uh, organization, which is kind of like a a competing organization within the Democratic Party with Tammany to run against George. So they saw that George and the Working Men's Party being such a threat that they needed to uh, join forces. And Hewitt is no lightweight. He's a congressman, uh, Civil War ordinance industrial hero, uh, very uh, prominent. Um, I, I'd say that he was a heavy hitted uh, hitting hired gun for the purposes of stopping this uh, labor insurgency, which is a way to describe it. So why do we learn this history? I think it's good, and you know, in particular, I'm in a, the um, AFL union as a city employee, and I spoke to my uh, fellow union people today. So it's important to uh, know your history. So Tammany, what they did and why they were so successful is that they created a parasitical parallel to the intended Demo host Democrats organization for what, uh, for that which they wish to control. So in order to be successful, they, uh, they paralleled the, the Democratic Party often becoming um, officials themselves, but always close by the, uh, where the power is. 
And uh, most importantly, they feigned concern for the poor while doing the bidding of the elites who kept the poor down and powerless. So that was the, the trick that Tammany used so well for so many years. And I think it's important for, for union folk to uh, consider whether their interests are being served uh, as they are today. So why were the New York elite so worried about uh, Henry George? Well, let's take the Catholic church, uh, what I call the Willie Horton-like ruse with uh, Tammany's O'Donohue. So what did uh, O'Donohue say? Um, he said to, uh, uh, per, um, to the uh, Preston who's uh, with the Catholic church, he said three days before the election, so this is like on a Saturday before the Tuesday election back in 1886. He said, hey, what's this I hear about the church supporting George for mayor? And this is important and I'll be getting into this is that uh, George had a very zealous uh, advocate uh, within the church, a priest named uh, Edward McGlynn. And uh, so it was getting around that uh, you know, maybe the Catholic Church supports George in this election. So here's what uh, Monsignor Preston had to say to uh, this softball pitch, let's say, that uh, O'Donohue said, we never interfere in elections, <clears throat> but we feel George's principles are unsound and unsafe, contrary to the teachings of the church. They will be the ruin of the working men he professes to befriend. Uh, and then tens of thousands of flyers of this statement from the uh, uh, Preston uh, are passed out at all masses just two days before the election on Sunday, the next day. So pretty well orchestrated, I would say. So George, uh, Henry George goes above Preston to the Archbishop Michael Corgan. There's a picture of or a, a painting of him there responds to a hit job that Corrigan pinned at George's expense with this. And um, I guess I'm not gonna let on at this point, but uh, Henry George goes way above uh, an archbishop uh, in later years. But here he says, you like to clothe opinions on political economy in the garb of official religious teaching other leaders of the church higher than yourself think otherwise. Uh, kind of gutsy, I would say. Uh, Archbishop, you are wrong, he goes, about private property and land. And this is the, the point of Henry George and his remedy for the um, uh, fixing uh, poverty. But you are wrong about private property and land. God, not man, made land and when its value increases, because of community improvements, that value belongs with the community. And very succinctly uh, presenting the, the idea behind Henry George. Then he faults Corrigan with the logical error of what's called the non-distribution of the middle. And this is getting a little bit erudite, but this is the kind of thing that Henry George would do. He'd write to the archbishop and say, your logic is all wrong. And the logic goes like this that if you say the result of human exertion is property and then say land is property and therefore individuals should own the property, the thing that's missing is that land is not created with exertion. And this is the, the major point in um, people who follow Henry George and call themselves Georges. The point is that land was not created by exertion. So it's not like uh, I make a pizza and I own the pizza well, I didn't create the land, so there is an obligation if I'm going to monopolize that land that I owe something to uh, society. So that's the, the point. So I, I think this is a very good interchange, but just keep in mind that this is so close. Well, he actually, he wrote this right after the election. He didn't have time to quibble in the heat of that election, but this is what he said in response. So going further, uh, he says, besides 
cannot the community receive rent as well as an Astor or a Trinity Church Corporation? So this is really putting it out that uh, private individuals and, uh, and other church and uh, religious organizations are collecting rent. So why shouldn't the, uh, the city be collecting the rent for the benefit of the population? So, so with that short introduction, uh, let me get into the molding of George for the global stage. Um, George describes himself, and I think this is very clear and very uh, important to, to, to catch, that he describes himself as a pioneer who goes in advance of politics, who breaks the road after which will be tried by millions. It kind of relates to the story I'm gonna be talking about uh, in the post-election, but he sees himself as a pioneer. Uh, but he started out uh, at the age of 15 as a foremast boy. And you can see the foremast there of the ship. Travels to Australia and India, abandoning formal schooling, even though he, he did study independently outside of formal school. So there is a reason that he became as well educated as he was. But one of the things that he did at a young age was see the misery of Calcutta in, uh, in India. At his union, uh, United Labor Party acceptance speech at Cooper Union, friends called him a conservative. So these are all like things that are tipping the, the hand of why Henry George did what he did. Uh, okay. So, um, so continuing on, uh, George sidestepped service in the Civil War. I never read anything that he even considered uh, joining the Civil War. He was in California of all time, of all things. He was uh, 22 in 1861. Um, but on behalf of the San Francisco Herald, he travels to New York, uh, December 1868, to confront the Associated Press and Western Union monopolies. So uh, confronting archbishops and other things, uh, it's no match to Henry George. He takes on uh, some of the largest monopolies at the time. He loses, what he's trying to do is uh, get a, a contract to, to get news feed uh, so he can sell uh, to the newspapers that he was running back in California. But during his trip to New York City at the time in, in uh, 1869, he witnesses the, the great progress with poverty, uh, which you can see there, pictures of uh, the tenements in New York City. And he starts thinking about his great work that he's about to write. He becomes a uh, acting editor of San Francisco Monitor, a Catholic weekly uh, with a large Irish readership in May uh, 1869. This is a, a time he writes the land question in California, identifies land value taxation as a solution to poverty. So he's got these ideas that he develops more thoroughly later on. Uh, he learns of the unrest in Ireland due to the injustice of the British landlords. Uh, he, in 1869, uh, September, he meets Democratic Governor Henry Haight, becomes an editor for the pro Haight Oakland Daily Transcript, and then the Democratic Party Oregon Sacramento Reporter. So uh, he's leaving California pretty well connected, uh, maybe not earning the, the, the money that he, he'd want to get, but uh, he sees his fortune being in New York City, but he is rubbing elbows with uh, significant uh, power brokers. So the thing that's interesting is people that he meets, uh, he's still in California and he meets William Swinton. This is the brother of New York labor radical John Swinton shown here, somebody who features prominently soon, uh, kind of uh, interesting that John Swinton, the, the brother of William runs for mayor in 1874, he doesn't get very many votes, very, not very well organized. But uh, it's two months uh, after the Great Rising uprising, which I'm gonna be talking about 
It's when he begins writing Progress and Poverty, and this is the, uh, the book that Henry George is most known for. He publishes the first edition in 1879 when he's in California. He sets the plates for the uh, publication that gets published in New York City, comes out in 1880. So although it is New York that it's molded that I'm describing here, there are some uh, conditions which Henry George must respond or understand when he arrives in August 1880. Uh, for example, the police riot of January 13, 1874, Tompkins Square Park. And this park features prominently in labor history, which is um, probably a place that uh, a statue to Henry George is, is needed, or at least somebody from the, the labor movement. But what the police were responding to were communists holding meetings, uh, mere talking about uh, uh, ideas is what was enough to get the, the police clubs uh, swinging. So here's another thing that uh, very prominent in the story that I'm gonna be talking about is the, the Irish and German immigrants coming to uh, the US and New York. In the 1880s, you had 1.5 million Germans and close to uh, two thirds of a million Irish coming to the US. Most of the Irish are Catholic. Uh, a third of the 1.2 million New Yorkers in 1880s are either from Germany or Ireland. Uh, what's kind of sad, but it's true, it's important to point out that the British were involuntarily shipping poor Irish, 50% of the population, if you can imagine that, to America by steamship at government expense. So it's a little wonder that we were getting Irish immigrants. Uh, it was the potato famine of the 1840s that was an early cause of immigration, but uh, getting into the 1870s and 80s, it was all pure economics. And let me talk about what the economics were all about. Uh, landlords back in Ireland could run their farms without squatters. And that's what they were getting away, getting rid of, let's say. Uh, Henry George called it dumping garbage, a very strong term, but in his social problems, he was talking about the Irish being treated like garbage. Uh, landlords back in Ireland could run their farms without squatters and later rent to the same poor who had been dumped in America. Those who came to live where their former landlords had more land in America. It's kind of a nice trick. You win on both ends. And this is what was uh, driving the, the Irish and the nationalists uh, mad, as well as Henry George. Uh, don't want to spend a whole lot of time on this slide. It's a little gross, but uh, it gets into the population density of uh, the Lower East Side, the 10th Ward, uh, 276,000 people per square mile. Uh, that's uh, today, it's around 27, 28,000, which is about one tenth. So whatever you think about New York, it was 10 times worse. Uh, the statement was that the only thing worse about uh, then living in a tenement was being evict evicted from one because then you had to figure out where it lived. And then the, the last thing uh, relates to the horse standing there that in the 1880s, there were 60,000 horses generating 2.5 tons of manure, 60,000 gallons of urine per day. So if you can wrap your minds around the, the, the environment that uh, people had to put up with. So the, the bowling of George, uh, America was industrializing. Uh, between 1860, 1890, you had uh, a vast increase in the amount of steel being produced. And this is what was uh, creating the jobs for the primarily Irish and, and Germans, as well as other uh, immigrants. 0 0.013 to 10.4 tons of steel. Uh, it was the great upheaval, as it was called, June 21st, 1877, when Pennsylvania striking miners uh, were called communistic foreigners. They went on strike. Hundreds were hanged, uh, killed throughout the U.S. I read a, uh, a National Guardsman um, newspaper, and they talked about uh, New York 
guardsmen being sent up to Buffalo and Albany and shooting uh, strikers up there. But uh, back in uh, the hometown here in Manhattan, there was a thing called the Silk Stocking Brigade. Uh, they were celebrating uh, getting 6,000 rounds of ammo in anticipation of a riot in Thompson Square Park, uh, primarily in the Seventh Regiment on Park Avenue. You had the Vanderbilts, Roosevelt's, Van Rensselaer's, Harriman's, um, playing uh, soldier, uh, putting in some time. I mean, it, they weren't slouches, but uh, they were having a good old time of it. So uh, I think we should thank God that they stayed put, eating, dancing, and of all things, watching minstrel shows, which was reported in the newspaper that I read. So going to the, the German side of things, uh, Germany had a 1878 anti-socialist laws caused a lot of intellectuals coming to New York City. And this is reflected in Marx's first international and the Socialist Labor Party being established uh, in New York City in the 1870s. So let's get into the, the, the election. One of the things that the reason why I'm making this presentation about the election, I call it the golden promise because I think there is, there is there was an opportunity that I think was missed. And this is really the, the secret to what I'm uh, presenting today. And let me uh, describe what this golden promise was. So George arrives in August, 1880 by train. Uh, you probably know that the Transcontinental Railroad was finished in 1869, but I don't imagine that there was regular traffic, but by 1880, it was. So early on, this is a, one of these ironic things. Uh, uh, George gets a ghostwriting job from Congressman Abram Hewitt, the guy that he runs against in uh, six years later. And he's making enough money doing this uh, to live fairly well. And he's writing policy on labor uh, for, uh, for Congress. Um, interesting. So the new edition of George's Progress and Poverty is published and gets noticed as a workingman's advocate on account of that and other writings. Lower cost editions are widely circulating and you have several million copies uh, in circulation by 1890. And this is where we get into the, the friend of uh, Henry George, uh, father Edward McGlynn, a zealous follower at a uh, had a, uh, parishioners, 25,000 uh, parishioners had a, a wide following. And I put down 149 East 28th Street because that's exactly 10 streets uh, to the same address as the Henry George School of Social Science. So the St. Stephen's uh, Church that he um, preached at was uh, exactly 10 blocks away. Uh, so Henry George, uh, you know, meets uh, Edward McGlynn, uh, an Irish Catholic. He meets Patrick uh, Ford, another uh, Irish Catholic. Uh, this one, uh, Ford is an editor of the Irish World. He's a radical labor activist and an Irish nationalist. And Ford introduces George to a Irish national a guy named Michael Davitt, who's touring the, the U.S., and he's touring on behalf of what's called the Irish and Land League. And he's looking to expand into America. Uh, then uh, Ford pays for George to go to Ireland uh, to see firsthand what he's been reading and, and talking about for so long. Now that was from 1881 into 1882. So prior to... Uh, um, well, so, so it was March 1881, another gentleman, uh, James Murphy, invites George to speak at a land league meeting in Canada and upstate New York. So this is a, another thing where it's kind of like labor organizing, but it's more social justice. Uh, but he's uh, getting involved in public speaking. But before George arrived in uh, New York City, there was an Irish activist named Charles Stewart Parnell. He's also touring the, the US 10 weeks, 62 cities. 
including a joint session of Congress. So in, they're getting quite a few uh, uh, important uh, events to speak at. And he began that in January 1880 before the August arrival, Henry George. So he raised a quarter million dollars back in 1880. Uh, it's a pretty tidy sum. Uh, he's telling of the horrors of the Irish land war back home, uh, advancing the land league. And uh, upon his arrival back in Ireland, he's imprisoned. But during all that time, he does get out and he gets the British to back off on the recently enacted reforms against tenant farmers. So he's a, an Irish hero. The, the, the picture shown here is uh, Lewis Post. He's a future uh, undersecretary of labor for the Wilson. But at this time, um, Lewis Post is a, a, an early ally of Henry George. In fact, uh, I mentioned one of the articles I read uh, that formed uh, a lot of the information that I'm talking about tonight. It was written by Lewis Post. But the, the meetings that we were talking about were being held in New York City, called for no rent to support the Irish workers and the nationalization of Irish land. And George is considered part of the David uh, or David Ford camp of of radical uh, advocates. So uh, Henry George is not uh, considered at this time a, a conservative or um, he's solidly within this radical camp. And soon thereafter in 1882, February 11th, the Central Labor Union uh, was formed. And this is to uh, cons consolidate a lot of the uh, um, desires for labor people to get into politics. And this is the, the point here, uh, October 21st, 1882, George uh, dines with Lewis Post and other what called mugwumps, which were independent political people, people that uh, maybe not in the Republican or Democratic party, but maybe independent, uh, mostly reformers, uh, included a, a congressman. So uh, the, uh, there was a, a desire to keep the two uh, groups separate. Uh, the, the union people were asked, do you want to have one big meeting? And they said, no, we want to meet ourselves. You can meet with congressmen some other place. So they, uh, they met at Delmonico's and had a good time. So the golden promise of Henry George, the CLU revives what they had at one time, a United Labor Party. And this is the party that uh, Henry George um, became the, the leader of. Uh, so they start, restarted their United Labor Party. And this is getting pretty close. This is August when you had September, October. No, so this is three months before the election, they revived this party. And John Swinton, you might recall that name, uh, now living in New York City, this is the labor radical. Uh, his paper advocates the nomination of George for mayor. So it's all coming together pretty quickly. Uh, so it's not a cakewalk, this election of 1886. There's many obstacles. And at the right, this is not the, the ticket of the time, but it's an example of a, of a ballot that was used. Uh, interesting, uh, when you relate it to our most recent uh, election, Political parties were required to print and distribute their own ballots. They were required to post poll watchers, usually with an army of volunteers. The, the Labor Party had no uh, election inspectors as Fatty Walsh pointed out to us early in this talk. Uh, New York City handed out $226,000 to established parties to pay poll watchers and pay uh, New York City captains to uh, to do the electioneering. Uh, this comes to 40,000 people receiving some part of this money, which is 20% uh, of the electorate. So the established parties had a very large head start. And uh, while I was preparing this presentation, I heard on the TV that uh, the two candidates running for the next mayor of uh, New York City had received uh, 7 million, a uh, similar amount of money, I suppose, 
but the, the same kind of thing is going on today. Uh, so of the 20 local newspapers, none favored uh, George. We see a photo here of, uh, of Terrence V. Powderly. Um, he was very active in this uh, campaign. The Labor Party began a, a newspaper of its own. Uh, George was making seven public appearances a day and he found the people to speak on his behalf, including uh, Terence Powderly, uh, the head of the Knights of Labor, a very early uh, organization and uh, very distinct in the sense that he had African-Americans, uh, people of Chinese descent, women, um, uh, trade unionists, uh, uh, skilled and unskilled in his organization. It wasn't a union, but it was definitely a, a labor organization. Also economist E.R.A. Seligman, uh, he was uh, involved in this campaign. Uh, a lot of women uh, labor activists, uh, part of the suffragist movement, uh, had a novelist and clerics. So here, here we go, uh, the Saturday before the election, you had what was called a monster parade through the city. And it was really exciting to hear about how they organized this thing. It was almost like a, a, a drill where they uh, had people setting up at different corners and then coming together. They started at uh, Cooper Union, they ended at Thompson Square Park, very symbolic for the prior struggles uh, with George and the reviewing stand. Uh, so despite the downpour, this is you know all through the uh, month of October before the election, it was clear and uh, no rain at all, but on the night of uh, the Saturday before the election, you had 30,000 people march despite the, the heavy rainfall. So Hewitt barely campaigned. Not much is known about what uh, Teddy Roosevelt did, but uh, Father McGlynn and George, they rode together in horse-drawn carriage uh, throughout the city, despite McGlynn's reprimand not to campaign with George. So that was a, that was a disadvantage that uh, uh, a Catholic priest could not uh, be with Henry George and speak on his behalf uh, he was uh, prevented from doing that. And uh, another little trick that the uh, Tammany machine tried to do was, was ta uh, taunt Powderly saying, uh, you don't support George, do you? <laughs> and so that uh, caused Powderly to come out and go to the polling stations with uh, George, show his support. So this is the result. Um, the polls opened at six in the morning, they closed at four. Uh, Hewitt got the most, 41%. George got 31, Roosevelt got 28. And one thing that was pointed out in the uh, uh, o, uh, O'Donnell book was that all Tammany needed to do is flip 14 votes per polling station uh, at a total of 18, uh, 812 stations in order to sign line George. So because not having a, a poll clerk or poll watchers, uh, this is a thing that could have happened. Um, but it's just one of those things that you will never know, but uh, this is what happens in, in the elections. So now we get uh, near the end of the presentation where I do a little autopsy of uh, the election and what happened. Uh, after the election, there still was a, a lot of enthusiasm for uh, working men coming together, creating a party on their own so they didn't have to rely on the, the Democratic or the Republican Party. And there was a lot of talk about a state um, party, a national party with Henry George on the ticket. And it's important to realize that uh, in New York City, 1886 was the municipal elections in 1887 was a state election. And then 1888, he had the a presidential election. So there's always opportunity for campaigning. And that was what was going on. <clears throat> but thing that's uh, very important to realize, and sometimes uh, being in New York City, you think, well, this is where the world starts and ends. But uh, no, there was a lot of things going on throughout the, the United States, for example. 
in Chicago, a United Labor Party elected a state senator and seven state assemblymen. Uh, Cleveland sent, sent two progressive Democrats to Congress. In Milwaukee, uh, they elected a progressive state senator, six state assemblymen, and a congressman. And then later on, you had Socialist Party uh, mayors uh, going in eight, uh, 1910, and then for a long time in uh, eight, 1916 and 1940. So the, the activity of Henry George and the people in New York City had ramifications outside of the city itself. And that's one of the things I think is a good takeaway from what I'm talking about tonight. Uh, probably the best takeaway is right here. This is Democratic Governor uh, David B. Hill, who saw the and sensed what was going on in New York City in 1886. And without any effort by the United Labor Party, uh, um, the governor uh, enacted uh, on the strength of that showing a 10 hour work day for railroad workers, Saturday half holidays for state workers, Labor Day began, uh, became a state holiday. Uh, nobody organized for this. This is just something that he did because he was uh, concerned and I don't know, maybe he was secretly uh, pleased. But anyway, there was regulation of tenements. There's laws against child labor. There was a renewal of the state arbitration board. And then uh, they hired eight uh, factory inspector positions filled with labor leaders. So this is, a, this is something that uh, I'm not sure that was a part of the calculus, let's say, of what was about to happen. Uh, despite the hopes of the United Labor Party becoming uh, uh, a state and national party, things started to unravel. December 1886, McGlynn was ordered to Rome to account for his disobedience. He doesn't go. Uh, Progress and Poverty, the book that Henry George wrote and so many people read and became uh, radical because of his writing, is put on the church's index of forbidden works people were forbidden. And if you did, uh, I guess if you got caught reading it, you would uh, be, suffer some consequences. <clears throat> Shortly thereafter, McGlynn forms the Anti-Poverty Society, because I think he, he senses that the political movement is uh, starting to wane. Uh, July 1887, the Knights of Labor, the uh, quarterly organization, at one time had 700,000 members across the United States membership was cut in half because of the failure of a waterfront strike, um, primarily uh, led by the socialist dominated District 49. Uh, essentially what happened was uh, uh, they, they went out on strike, tried to get better benefits and they settled for exactly what they had before the strike. And that was very disheartening for the people that supported the strike who suffered and then had to take a consequence. Uh, nothing on their own. Uh, Powderly orders members to become pol politically independent. I think this is a very significant uh, part of uh, the reason why the uh, Labor Party didn't uh, proceed. Uh, Gompers, who's with the cig Cigar uh, Makers uh, Union, he forms the uh, AFL, the uh, union that I'm a, a member of. And he's distancing himself from socialists. And you can see, uh, the photo of Gompers there. Um, the Central Labor Committee moderates his message to one of a softer labor agenda. Uh, July 1887, all these things happening, McGlynn is excommunicated by Pope Leo XIII. Uh, Patrick Ford breaks with George and McGlynn. I uh, think he's more of a Catholic than he is a labor activist. Uh, he can't understand the position that George McGlynn is taking with the church and he reverts to a moderate uh, Irish uh, nationalism. So uh, I put this photo here because I think it's an example of uh, somebody taking their ball home um, from the, the ball field. Uh, George takes an interest in the United Labor Party for the first time. And this is in anticipation of the August uh, convention of the Labor Party in Syracuse. So here it is, the election of 1886 in November, 
it turns into 1887. There's this idea that we need to get candidates for the state election. Uh, there's this falling out of people in the political party. Um, George is rewriting the constitution with fewer labor demands, uh, but he's really big on land value taxation. He calls for the convention in 1887, uh, 87, he, a convention in Syracuse. At the convention, the, UR, the Labor Party is told that they could not hold membership in any other party, and that included the uh, Socialist Labor Party. So the Socialist Labor Party members who were very strongly supportive of Henry George during the uh, mayor's election, they arrive at the convention August 4th, the hope for reconciliation and uh, a compromise in their allotted time, they pretty much uh, dismiss Henry George saying that the labor movement is not wrapped up in George alone. And um, to his uh, discredit, I, I think in terms of uh, the big tent, let's say, um, between the convention and November, George uh, unleashes his attack on socialists saying, uh, the utter impracticality and essential childlessness of socialism and the delusional nature of its followers. That's not the kind of thing you say if you want to form a, a, a joint uh, movement. So I'm getting close to the end. We're going to be opening up for, uh, for questions, but I just want to reflect on what all this stuff means. Um, I think it's significant that uh, labor does not have a political party of its own. And this was a, a real possibility coming out of 1886 and definitely could have been the case in 1887, 1888, but it didn't happen. So let me suggest that perhaps there is a opportunity for realignment for a redo between Georgists and socialists. And I, I think I've got about three or four slides here and then we can get into Q&A. So the Socialist Worker Party, the America's best showing was in the 1912 election. Eugene Debs got 6%. He ran in 1900, 1904, 1908, 1920. He did run for Congress, didn't win. And this is my question for this presentation. Is it now time for the realignment of Georgists and socialists for their own party? Consider the, the fact that the Democratic squad opposes traditionalist Pelosi and others. You have the four of the squad here who want social welfare spending at levels above what traditionalists can promise. Republican and Democratic parties rely on real estate moguls for campaign contributions. And you see the real estate board of uh, New York right there. And I think one thing that we should, would all agree on is that the unearned ground rents are the grease of politics. When you have uh, money being made from the, the benefits of people in the community, the improvements in the railway, the police and such, that's what increases the value of land. And if you're not collecting the ground rents from things that we're doing, that are in increasing the value of the city, then that's being passed out to people who don't earn it. And that's the, the point that I'm making. So the land value taxation can pay for the squad's needs. They just don't know it. it brings up the question of maybe they're in the wrong party. Maybe they need to have their own party. And then my conclusion is that Back in 2012, 2016, there was pretty much a consensus that the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership and NAFTA were good things. I remember uh, thinking to myself that uh, after all this time, we got the two political parties in agreement on something. Uh, famously, President Obama said, those jobs that went overseas will never come back. But uh, I think some will agree that in 2016, some of the jobs came back. So I think it's interesting to see that perhaps um, maybe we should see what happens between now and uh, 2024. Uh, then I have a little um, 
piece of information here to back up the statement about the, the job not coming back. It was an article written in uh, 2012. So that was the, the presentation. I hope uh, it was enlightening. I hope it challenged people to say that maybe uh, uh, the reason we don't hear about the Whigs is that their time came and went. Uh, the question now is perhaps the the time for the Democratic Party or the time for the Republican Party has passed us and maybe there is an opportunity for uh, people within the labor movement and progressives to form their own party and get what they, they want. And I think the, the Georgist uh, program could and should be uh, part of that uh, political movement. So uh, Verima, if you want to uh, have people unmuted and ask questions, that'd be great. Uh, yes, I'm going to do that right now. Taking me a little time. You may want to go and unmute yourselves. Looks like Ed Dorson has a question, Marty. I'll start you off, Marty. Uh, what do you think this the those on the left need to do in order to gain in the United States a far greater uh, acceptance of uh, the public about the ideas independent of the label of being a socialist? Marty, you've got to unmute yourself. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, so you asked what the, the left can do to get over the, the label of being a socialist within the, uh, the, the milieu of uh, today, uh, essentially. Um, one of the things that they can do is demonstrate the viability of the things that they're talking about. And it's just like when uh, people with the, uh, the um, universal basic income, people with MMT, they, they talk about doing this and that. It all comes down to, but the, the landlords take everything that's left. And that's the, the point of the, the Georgia single tax that I think there's a perfect opportunity for people on the left to state a viable economic program that um, produces the funds other than taking it from people that uh, either earned it correctly or uh, earned it dishonestly. But uh, I think that's the, the long and short of the, the answer is that currently people who call themselves socialists and are in the general public, I think they, they're looking down on as, as people that are unviable, they're not with the times, that, uh, that there's, it's just not gonna happen. But I think that's not the, the case. And that's one of the reasons why I, I made this presentation to challenge people to, to say that maybe the political parties that are in existence now uh, will not be around, uh, say, in uh, eight years. Does that answer your question? To some extent. I mean, uh, I, I have this reason for asking. So I think you know, maybe maybe you don't, but, but I have been closely following the uh, public lectures and uh, postings and webinars that Richard Wolf has been doing. And I constantly post comments that uh, try to get his followers. He has, I mean, if you go to any one of his lectures in democracy at work or whatever, um, there are thousands of views and hundreds of comments posted. And I, I try to bring in a perspective that's, you know, more our perspective than 
in a pure socialist perspective. And the thing you know, I found interesting, I hardly ever have anyone challenging me in a negative way. I get a lot of likes. And from Richard Wolff himself, uh, he has from time to time positively commented on Henry George and on land value taxation. But uh, as far as I can tell, he doesn't see LVT as systemic. He doesn't see it as a systemic change. And I think that's intellectually the challenge we have with, with socialist intellectuals is get them to see that the, the public collection of rent equates to sy systemic change. Yeah. Yeah, I think that uh, it's a good point. I think it's a, a valuable service you're playing by being involved in uh, uh, people like uh, Richard Wolf. Uh, I'd urge others to, to do likewise. Yeah. yeah, I've been to several of his presentations. I, I, personally, I was disappointed that I waited there, waited there, waited there, had my hand up, and the meeting's over. <laughs> you know? uh, that was very disappointing to me. Um, but I think it's important that thousands of people show up. But I think we need to be uh, maybe a little bit more forceful on the idea of uh, what's practicality. You, know, you can, you know, one of the things that I was going to comment on uh, was that uh, if you look at the timing of the anarchist events like the Haymarket riot, and then there was a a killing in Ireland, uh, right when there was a movement to have progressive change, uh, you would have a uh, anarchist event, which doused the I guess it ended. likelihood. And it, it was like, well, if I was a billionaire, I would give anybody, you know, $100,000 to go do something that would be in my interest. Uh, I'm not saying that that's how things happen, or that I'm a conspiracy theorist, but uh, that's one of the things that happens in in progressive politics. I, I don't know what the answer to it, but uh, it's good that you brought it up, uh, what uh, socialists would have to do. I think they have to uh, come up with a, a viable economic model and taking money from rich people uh, is, is not necessarily a, a working model because, and that's the, the thing that the Georgist movements have in their favor is that when you, uh, when you get the wealth that society needs for the various infrastructure and uh, things that people want, you can't take land and put it in the, uh, in the, in the offshore. And that's whenever you, like we have a income tax and we, tax uh, uh, corporations, they, they just simply take their money offshore and there we are uh, living as a, a result of, of changing the tax codes. So um, land value taxation is one way that you, you, you capture the, the value that's not gonna leave. Maybe, it, maybe it's just too simple, uh, I don't know. Any other uh, questions? Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is uh, Sean. Um, there was something, I believe, many, many years ago in uh, Orange County where there was an effort to tax land that was in the periphery of, of um, this, you know, and basically it was in the periphery of the business center but suddenly this farmland was suddenly taxed at the rate that one would have the potential of it being, um, you know, used uh, for, you know, more, uh, more elaborate or more elevated um, uh, ways. And that, had, that actually was sort of a boosterist model in LA and in uh, Orange County that ended up in a way driving, um, a lot more um, uh, conurbation, a lot more uh, hyper growth in not only land values, but also forced farmers to kind of push, sell their land and move away from the, the urban centers. I'm just curious if the, uh, the, the, the manner of taxing uh, land would 
if it, if it would have some sort of effect of that sort, or would it actually be the, uh, would it actually uh, stop that type of um, uh, reaction? Yeah. yeah, well, that's a good question. I, I think when you look at tax policy, one of the things you have to understand is why are we doing it and are we doing it as a one-time fix uh, to get a, a, a amount of money? That's one of the problems with enterprise zones is that it's not uh, long-term. But uh, what you're describing is something that's kind of like a, uh, almost like a, a taking where you're uh, condemning the farmland to something else. I think the what uh, the Georgists and people with land value taxation look at is uh, where is the, the value of land the highest? Uh, don't be shy to not go after that because that's where the, the prize is. Uh, so by going on the periphery, that might be the case where you, you don't uh, interfere with where the money is and you just encourage uh, suburbanization or sprawl um, but uh, it's, um, I'm glad you brought it up because there's lots of ways of, of doing things but I think what I heard in the the question was a uh, uh, a matter of being timid about what we're going to do and it's almost like you got a hundred different ways of raising money to do things so let's do a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and and then we'll maybe have a, um, a sales tax. And when we put that all together, we can we can buy the city park or something. You know, that's it's kind of a, a timid way of going about things. Yeah, yeah, it was def it was definitely you're absolutely correct. It was the way in which sprawl accelerated because. Um, because the land was suddenly being taxed, not for the value that it could uh, produce as a farm, but suddenly as what it could produce as a shopping mall or as a cul-de-sac of suburban homes, yeah. it was more or less driving outward expansion of, uh, of sprawl. And yeah. I mean, w one of the things I noticed on the website earlier was that, you know, I just looked at, you know, Manhattan in terms of land value, it was, I think, assessed at like 5.2 billion an acre, or it might have even been larger than that, but that, you know, you've had enormous values of, of, of land in, let's say, Manhattan. And then as you go further out, you know, beyond Westchester and up, let's say, to Ulster County, you know, that value per acre really does drop considerably. Yeah. Um, and so everything has to do with these nexus points that were, you know, essentially related to trade and river navigation and, you know, a much earlier moment in his history. Um, but my question to you is, um, would would it be something that could be initiated, the Georgia's model, which I think is actually very inspired, almost a reworking, a re-understanding of, of, of taxation would it be possible to do it piecemeal, state by state or locality, without it hurting um, businesses in that area? Or is it something that would have to be done almost on a federal level to, uh, to assure that uh, it's not something that, again, drives uh, you know, oligarchic business away? Yeah, uh, I think I'd have to defer to a gentleman in our organization named uh, Dan Sullivan. Uh, he pointed to the point, or he pointed to the uh, point in the uh, Constitution or federal uh, laws that prevents uh, land value taxation on a federal level. So it is a matter of state and local uh, implementation. And I think uh, Ibrahima would be quick to point out that uh, if you do something, it would have to be uh, within the within the entire city. You can't do it like well, let's uh, have a land value tax in uh, Forest Hills and and uh, see how that works. It would have to be something that would be by the entity uh, itself. And yes. I think one of the one of the tricks is that uh, it would almost have to be. Uh, like revenue neutral, if we could figure out a way of having a relief on income tax, for example, so that if somebody uh, 
wanted to be encouraged to go along with it, we could say, well, look, the reason why we're, we're doing this is to, to untax uh, productivity and incomes and yeah. to where it, it's better put. So there's a lot of challenges, but it has to be a, a local and a state issue. It's not going to be, um, you know, on a federal. But I, I did pin something recently. I think it became a, uh, a, a um, blog enter, uh, entry on the website there where I said that if we could get to the point where we had zero price land, which means that nobody's profiting from any land, we could go to that extreme. And if we raised more money than we needed, we could uh, buy treasuries and fund the, fund the federal government in that way of going to 100% land value tax. But uh, uh, that might be uh, fantasy, but yeah, I think it's good to think about how far you could take the um, land value taxation. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, I, I have a, a small point and then a question. Peter, yeah, of course. Hey, I just wanted to say to Sean Daly that I think that the um, Los Angeles um, taxation situation that he referred to is the subject of the movie Chinatown by Roman Polanski. Um, so um, I just wanted to make that that point. It sounds like you were describing Los Angeles, uh, you know, I guess around the 1920s or something. Yeah, yeah, actually there, there's a great book I, I, um, by uh, Davies, um, who's a, I guess a Marxist critic in LA, um, urban critic, and I, I, I read that in his, one of his books, but I, I love that movie, Chinatown. Right. It's a, it's a classic. Yep. So that, that pretty much fits. The, uh, <laughs> and was, there. It was all about water supply. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Mulholland. Yeah. The whole Mulholland thing. Right. So my, my question to Marty and, and um, maybe this uh, um, can also help answer Ed's question is why at the end of um, your presentation today, why did George, uh, call the social. Why was he so um, kind of mean, if you will, to the socialists? Why did he? Why did he say they were delusional? Though those are really strong yeah. words. Yeah, that, that that was important that I, I put that in there, and I was I'm actually making a critique of the the Georges movement. I'm actually saying that perhaps we should uh, revisit the time when uh, when the Georges and the socialists were united, where we may not have agreed 100%, but we're part of a big tent political movement because you saw where the socialists were going along with the land value taxation uh, and all Henry George had to do was just uh, get what he, uh, what he preached in his progress in poverty. And if at a future time he'd said, well, you know, I'm, I'm done with, I'm done, done with this because I got the land value taxation, but he didn't do that. Uh, I showed the picture of the of the kid taking the ball home because he didn't want to play anymore. Right. Uh, that that was my illustration of what what was being done there in August in the, in the Syracuse. Uh, I think it was a, it was a mistake, and that's why I titled that section the the creation is uh, uh, bigger than the the author because the, the author being uh, Henry George, he created this and. And he claimed that he was the pioneer. So in a sense, you could kind of see that he might do that, uh, where he he blazed the trail and uh, people are going to follow afterwards. And uh, he he never illustrated a uh, being a, a party man. Um, but uh, so I'm taking a little bit of liberty as a Georgist to be critical, to say that uh, that perhaps we need to look backward and see what's in our true interest as uh, people within the, the labor movement and people who are more progressive. Right. I, what, what kind of socialists would be, um, would be compatible with Henry George and what kind of socialists wouldn't? Well, um, I, I mentioned some of the things uh, and I'm not an expert in in socialism, but uh, 
every time I hear talks, uh, you know, like when I hear uh, the squad talking, uh, I hear about taxing the rich and taxing um, uh, Wall Street, which you know, there are some good ideas uh, within taxing Wall Street. For example, uh, the 2007, 2008 a financial crisis, that was really just a matter of of allowing uh, uh, land value to go out of control because uh, you had cheap properties being bundled and then people not even knowing what it was that they had. And it was a fact that uh, land was part of those mortgages that uh, created that bubble. Yeah. So if you had a, a Georgia's type system, that uh, bubble couldn't have existed. But that acknowledgement uh, is not uh, available to people in the socialist movement, the Democratic Party, Republican Party. It's just one of those bubbles that happens. And I think as a uh, intellectual organization, I think we need to examine what is the result of some of these disasters that we see and uh, are we uh, doomed to have it repeat because we didn't grasp it. But in terms of uh, the problems with um, socialism, um, I don't, you know, one of the things that Henry George and the reason why he was so popular among uh, socialists is that he, in his progress in poverty, he says that, that uh, the ideas of socialism are good and novel. He, he talked about the, the idea of cooperation and cooperatives. And so he's, on board with the idea that you do things in concert. And he was very much a, an environmentalist. If you look at the posi uh, position of not monopolizing land or air or water, that uh, uh, what God made is uh, meant for everybody. And if somebody's going to monopolize something, they owe society for doing that. Um, I think if we uh, pulled together in that kind of sense, maybe not identifying what socialists think themselves, but maybe come to the table of how do we get beyond where we're at? Um, um, right. Maybe that's the direction. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of afraid that uh, we haven't seen a, a major war for a while, and I'm, I'm afraid that there's going to be some context for a new war, and then we're going to say, oh, that, now I now I remember why we we we, uh, we don't elect certain people and other people. Uh, right, that's uh, Kamala Harris is pretty much CIA. Um, according but is he, to some, he's talking about war. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, you know, she's um, going to be the sword um, if if certain people's predictions are correct. But wow. I, I have an idea for I don't know the Henry George School or whatever for Georgism or something. Um, I just, if, I, if it's okay, if I could just throw it out. Sure. Uh, and it's something Marty, you've talked about a lot and certainly Ed, Ed is like this, the, the sharp end of the spear on this, um, you know, Ed's idea or somebody's idea, I guess it, I don't know if Ed's the author of it or, or if Henry George himself is the author of it, but the idea of, the price of land going to zero when well that that's something i wrote yeah is that oh so you're the you're the t you're the originator of that idea well, well you know I, 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 Marty just wrote a, a recent piece on it right yeah but it's kind of kind of core to the georgia's uh, I, I mean well i don't uh, whoever whoever is responsible for the um you know for the germination of the idea i know ed ed's spoken about it a lot that i've witnessed oh, okay um, i haven't heard that right so um I think that's the key to um, to kind of, if not if not if not aligning Henry George with socialists, then at least delivering Henry George on the doorstep of socialists, you know, to to a form so that they can they can look at it as a you know a basket of really delicious goodies, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. So without 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 the, the the price of land going to zero and the and the uh, accompanying kind of um, I don't know castration of banking, um, then then um, Henry George doesn't appeal, you know, to the to the socialist mind frame. Yeah, but yeah. Um, but if you if you if you take a, if you defang the lion, you know, if you take if you take the um, the the 
the fangs out of banking, then uh, wow, it's a what a beautiful thing. Yeah, well, it's kind of interesting during the research for this talk, I found in the, the Lewis Post assessment of the campaign, uh, a reference to zero price land. So uh, I'll, I'll uh, copy that and send it to you. Okay. So I, I came up with it uh, uh, independently of something that was around back in 1886, at least. Cool. Uh, but it was, uh, the con it was conceived back then. Right. But that's, but, that's a political, as a political, um, I don't know what the word is, a way to, a way to um, make Georgism relevant, you yeah. know, to today. Yeah, I think what, what, what happened to me was I came, I, I was talking about zero price land and, and uh, brought it up a few times and maybe people didn't understand it. So one day I, you know, in this pandemic, um, I'm talking to people who do a lot of writing. They say, you know, this has been a, a godsend. And uh, so uh, I was reading the New York Times. Uh, some guy was, well, somebody critiqued a, a book. I uh, can't remember the guy's uh, uh, Anderson. And so he was, he was critical of uh, conservatives and saying that he was just part of the, uh, uh, the, the liberal uh, attitude where they just let the... Uh, uh, conservatives run wild. So here he is <clears throat> trying to uh, make up for a lost time because he was he was uh, uh, asleep at the wheel, let's say, so to speak. So he comes up with the ideas that, uh, you know, for, for example, why don't we tax the internet since it was uh, created by government? And he goes into things like that. And uh, so I took that book and then I took a book on degrowth that's really... Uh, gets into the, the uh, socialist critique. And I took them together and wrote the paper Zero Price Land. And it's essentially a, a, a two book, uh, book review uh, with a critique of uh, Henry George. And I think it's a, it's a good way of, of uh, addressing this issue. If you can mentally see that, um, <clears throat> that land is not being sold because <laughs> has a, a zero price. And the reason why it has a zero price is that you're obligated to do something once you take title of this stuff that has a zero price. So yeah. it's kind of a, a fun thing. It looks like Ed has a question, Ed. I, I was just going to uh, comment that, well, George was never real supportive of socialist policies. And he debated socialists throughout his political, you know, years. This was a pretty widespread uh, view among the single taxers of that era and after. If you if you do any reading in the literature of the day, written by or published by the single tax groups, all the way up uh, through, oh geez, all the way through to close to the Second World War there is a fairly constant uh, amount of editorial writing against socialism. And I, I think part of it has to do, with, in, in the United States at least, with um, Christianity, mm. and the conflict between Christianity and socialism. And one of the books that you can look at that really points this out was written by Max Hirsch, the title of the book is Democracy Versus Socialism. And it was published about 1905 or maybe a little a few years earlier than that. Uh, but, but Hirsch makes a really strong and Christian case against socialism and that socialism is really an antithesis to real democracy. So that, that, that viewpoint, you know, was pretty strong. And of course, uh, you know, with the Bolshevik Revolution uh, and the you know details of of life under under communism coming out, that just strengthened that view in the minds of a lot of people. Yeah, right. yeah. One of the things that uh, occurred to me while I was reading about the uh, machinations of the Catholic Church when it came to this election was that uh, uh, they're trying to protect their their turf, so to speak with the idea of charity, that there's always gonna be poor people and the church has a role of 
being the helping hand and all that. And I can just see somebody who was with a uh, socialist mind bent saying, well, screw that. I, I just want a good salary and I want to live well. I don't need uh, charity. So there's that uh, dynamic, but I think Ed, uh, you, you captured it well, is that there's a established, uh, maybe it's waning somewhat, but there's still a, a good degree of uh, dev uh, devotion to uh, the Christian faith. Well, it, it, it's, it's one of the basic reasons why Richard Wolff has really strongly emphasized cooperative associations you know, as the basis for his version of a socialist society, you know, not, uh, not state socialism, not hierarchy and centrally planned economies, but people coming together to form cooperatives. Uh, it, to, in my mind, it traces, it traces back to Proudhon and his mutualist philosophy. Yeah. Was the, was the Christian, um, critique of socialism one uh, from the point of view of the Protestant work ethic, or is it, um, um, were socialists painted as being against religion? Like a Protestant work ethic being, you know, you have to, um, I guess you have to suffer um, in order to enjoy and capitalism offers a better dose of suffering and I, therefore is more virtuous. I, I, it's, it's, in my view, it's very, it's complex and there are many different, you know, expressions of, of emphasis and view on this, but uh, the origins, I would say, go back to the enlightenment and the renewed uh, emphasis on the individual over the collective. And so with the individual emphasis, there comes into the, the play, the issue of property and property rights. And as Fred Harrison has written about, for example, the Magna Carta, you know, up until the time the Magna Carta was signed, the feudal, feudal society had reciprocity that, you know, the feudal lords had a trustee responsibility. They were st stewards of the land. But with the Magna Carta, you see the beginning of the privatization of land and land being bought and sold and mortgaged sure. and commodified and so forth. Yeah, and right. Commodified. And that, that that really was a very beginning of of the enlightenment almost at that stage and and the emphasis on individuals stand alone and, and of course in the united states there's always been this myth of the rugged individual you know well, we we conquered the frontier remember that's a good point how do you done it? More questions? Well, I don't see anybody raising their hands and uh, it's 7.55, we have five more minutes. Well, good, that was a good, uh, good discussion. I'm glad we got it all recorded and uh, people can use it to, uh, to do further research. Well, thanks, Marty, enjoyable. Thank you very much. Right. Yeah, it was, uh, I was telling Ibrahima that uh, it takes a little time to read the books, read the, the sources. Uh, it's always worthwhile. Here, here's a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Sean. Yeah, um, I, I recommend two books. Uh, you know, one was uh, Mike Davis, City of Corpse, that came out uh, decades ago. And there's another one that came out of maybe about 13 years ago by a woman named King, Kim Moody called From Real Estate, no, From the Welfare State to Real Estate. And it's actually one of the best books I've ever read that went very on a, on a very granular level from 1975 to the late Bloomberg uh, period in the manner by which New York um, embraced real estate speculation in a very aggressive way. And, uh, you know, I, I just imagine it could be a very good book for you guys to look at because it it really does um, uh, suggest how you know certain cities just seize on real estate as a way of uh, of, of driving up prosperity within their uh, within their districts, and sometimes it just ends up creating such inequality that it's and ends up sort of cascading into um, social issues. That's yeah. a very very interesting reference. Would you mind uh, writing that in the chat? 
Yeah, I'll try. I'm not. Yeah. I'm not as uh, versed in Zoom <laughs> chat, but I will try. Yeah, it's yeah. called. Uh, it's Kim Kim Moody, uh, Moody from real from the welfare state to real estate. Yep, yeah. that that's exactly what happened uh, since the uh, the 1980s uh, when wages stopped increasing. So the government basically promoted uh, house buying as a way for people just to uh, to make up for the income that is not coming. So we keep consuming. So we moved from a uh, welfare state to asset-based welfare. Yeah. Yes. That's a, a moving target. So you, yep. you think you're moving ahead, but you just get further in debt. And... Actually, here, here's one last question that I found interesting. You just, I think it was just today, Tulsi Gabbard, this Democrat from Hawaii, um, said that she believed that that the excess profits that have occurred in mega corporations like uh, Amazon or Home Depot or Walmart, that there actually should be an, an, a specific tax um, to the, the, the excess profits of those comp companies during this COVID period. Because in a way, the locally focused, geographically defined small businesses were the ones that were really destroyed by COVID. Um, and they, in a way, um, manage enormous outsized profits pr primarily because of that. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of an interesting concept. In a way, it does tie back to George on that level of, uh, of uh, you know, it's not necessarily, it's not necessarily land value, but it has to do with g geography. Yeah, and monopoly. Yeah. yeah. No, that's interesting. I'll have to read... Uh... That, yeah, oh, I, I didn't think, remember the, the name of the guy that wrote that book, uh, Kurt Anderson. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that article I wrote, or a paper I wrote on zero price land, just go to academia.edu and look for my name, Marty Roland, and then search for that paper. I've got about 10 papers in there. Great. So looks like we... Uh... It's uh, almost eight o'clock now. You want to conclude and then uh, we call it a night? Yeah, yeah I think I uh, just want to thank everybody for sticking in and asking the questions. I think it's always challenging. Uh, I do want to give a, a plug for uh, Ed Dodson and his 60,000 uh, article uh, database <laughs> keeping up. Uh, I think you should, if you're interested in finding anything about Henry George, uh, Ed is a person to talk to as far as getting the, the reference, but uh, but it, uh, Ed brings up a very good point of what the, the challenge is. And uh, I didn't get too much into religion, but uh, I think there was a strong element of, of uh, the Catholic church, for example, trying to protect its turf in this uh, example. But uh, I think it was fun. I think it's something to, to think about, uh, you know, back when, uh, 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 Donald Trump is running for president, I was saying to myself that this is a guy who's going to destroy the Republican Party. And being a anti-war activist, I couldn't think of anything better to happen uh, than for that to happen. So now I'm, I'm giving this presentation about how um, maybe the political parties are going to realign. Uh, I'm not putting out much hope necessarily, but uh, it's possible. But that's really all I wanted to say. And I appreciate everybody staying in and being interested. Uh, Ibrahima, if you wanted to uh, promote- I'd like to make a couple of announcements, up. if you wouldn't mind, Marty. What's that? Uh, just to let you know, we will be uh, taking a little break. We won't be having classes uh, until early January. And we have a very interesting class upcoming. For those of you who are interested in uh, experiments in land value taxation in the US and beyond. So Joshua Vincent from the Center of uh, the Study of Economics is going to be with us for five weeks. And uh, as I always do, if you like this event and you want us to keep doing stuff like this, please support us by making a tax deductible donation. I've just posted the link, it's in the chat and you can also visit our website. Thank you and have a nice evening and some great holidays. Okay, thank you. Bye everyone. Thank you.